tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations. With audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about roadside specters and subterranean subterfuge. I'm Otis Jiry, host of Scary Stories Told in the Dark podcast, now in its fifth season and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else podcasts can be found. And tonight I'll be filling in for our regular host, my good friend, Steve Taver. Come along, won't you, as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your wildest imaginations. Joining us tonight to help bring our frightening fiction to life is voice talent and producer Barry Bowman along with his good friends, Ms. Joanne Wilson and Mr. Alex Adamson. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our Theater of the Minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> our first tale tonight is written by Lucille Fletcher and was once the inspiration for one of the Twilight Zone's most popular episodes. Our audio adaptation of this unforgettable classic is voiced by Barry Bowman, with support from Joanne Wilson and Alex Adamson. In it, a man comes across a strange figure in the road while making his way home. When he picks up the lonesome traveler, he gets more than he bargained for. Without further ado, I present to you, The Hitchhiker. I'm in a trailer camp on I-40 just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, maybe it will help me. It'll... it'll keep me from going crazy. But I must tell this quickly. I... I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well. Perfectly well. Except I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1978 Ford V8, license number 6V7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know I'm at this moment. I'm perfectly sane. That is, it's not me that's gone mad, but something else. Something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. At any moment, the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, Mom. <laughs> Here, give me a kiss, and then I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. Oh, it's raining. Just stay here at the door. Hey, what's this? Tears? Oh, it's just the trip, Ron. I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Mom, there you go again. People do it every day. I know. But you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers on the road. Strangers? But look, don't worry. There isn't anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. Now, don't worry. Goodbye.
I was in excellent spirits. The drive ahead, even the loneliness, seemed like a lark. But I didn't count on him. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. Now, I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he'd got there. But I thought maybe a fast truck had picked him up, beaten me to the Skyway, and let him off. I, I didn't stop for him. And then late that night, I saw him again. It was on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I, I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I could see him quite distinctly, the bag, the cap, even the, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hailed me this time. I stepped on the gas like a shot. It's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidences, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. I stopped at the next gas station. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Uh, fill, fill her up, will you? Check your oil? No, thanks. No. Okay, let me get the gas cap here. Nice night, ain't it? Yes. Hasn't... Hasn't been raining here lately, has it? No, not a drop of rain all week. Oh, no? I suppose that hasn't done your business any harm. No, people drive through here all kinds of weather, mostly business, though. Ain't many pleasure cars out on the turnpike this season of the year. I guess not. What about hitchhikers? Hitchhikers here? <laughs> Why? 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 What's, what's the matter? Don't you, don't you ever see any? Well, a guy'd be a fool to start out to hitchhike on this road and just look at it. You mean you never see anybody? No, maybe they get a lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house, but then it's a pretty long ride. Most cars wouldn't pick up a guy for that long a ride. Yeah, this is a pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen nobody like that, have you? Oh, no, no, it's, uh, it's just a... Just a technical question. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, well, that'll be uh, twenty-four ninety-nine with the tax, sir. The thing gradually passed from my mind as a coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all the next day until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio. I saw him again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving, slowly drinking it all in when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor was his attitude menacing. He, he just stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little the cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he hailed me, started to walk forward. Hello. I had stopped the car, of course, for the detour. For a few minutes, I, I, I couldn't seem to find the new road. I realized that he must be thinking that I'd stopped for him. Hello. No, no, not just now. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Going to California? No, 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 not today. I'm, I'm going to New York. Sorry. Sorry. After I got the car back on the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit beside me, was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The light changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear.
What is it? What do you want? Uh, you sell sandwiches and uh, pop here, don't you? Yeah, we do in the daytime, but we're closed for the night. Well, I, I know, but I was just wondering if you could possibly let me have a cup of coffee, black black coffee. My wife's the cook, and she's in bed. Well, no, 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 now listen, just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right right beside here, and uh, a suspicious-looking man. Who it, is it, Henry? It's nobody, Mother. Just a fellow thinks he wants a cup of coffee. Go back to bed. I don't I don't mean to disturb you, but you see, I was driving along when I just uh, happened to look, and there he was. What was he doing? Uh, nothing. Ah, you've been hitting the bottle. That's what's the matter with you. Got nothing better to do than wake decent folks out of their hard-earned sleep. Get going. Get on. Well, it looked as though he was going to rob you. I got nothing in this den to lose. Now, on your way before I call out Sheriff Polk. I got into the car again and drove on, slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to rest a little, but I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. The few resort places there were closed. I'd seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again, maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew then that when I saw him next, I'd run him down. But I didn't see him again until late the next afternoon. I had stopped the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass. When he appeared across the tracks, He was leaning against a telephone pole. It was a perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun, yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't even look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheel sharply toward him. I I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then something, something went wrong with the car. It stalled right on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell, its, its cry, its whistle crying. Still, he stood there. Now I knew that he was beckoning beckoning me to my death. Well, I frustrated him that time. It started. It worked at last. I managed to back up. But after the train had passed, he... he was gone. And I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself be alone on the road for one minute. Uh, hello there. Hello. You like a ride? What do you think? How far are you going? Amarillo. I'll, I'll take you to Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas? Yeah, I'll, I'll drive you there. Gee. Hop in. Mind if I take off my shoes? Ugh, my feet are killing me. No, go right ahead. <sighs> Gee, what a break this is. Great car, decent guy, driving all the way to Amarillo. All I've been getting so far is trucks. You hitchhike much? Sure, only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the brakes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it would be. But I'll bet, though, if you got a good pickup in a fast car, you could... Get to places faster than, well, say another person in, in another car. I don't get you. Well, you take me, for instance. Uh, suppose I'm driving across the country at a nice steady clip of about 65 miles an hour. Couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for lifts uh, beat me to town after town, providing she got picked up every time in a car that was doing 75 or 80 miles an hour? I don't know. Maybe she could, maybe she couldn't. What difference does it make? Oh, it's no no difference. It's <laughs> just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. Oh, imagine spending your time in a great car thinking of things like that. Oh, what would you do instead? What would I do? <laughs> well, if I was a good-looking fella like yourself, I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and relax, and if I saw a good-looking... <laughs> hey! 
Hey! Did you see him? Did you see him too? See who? That man is standing beside the barbed wire fence. <laughs> I didn't see anybody. Right there! It was nothing, just a barbed wire fence. What do you think he was doing trying to run into a barbed wire fence? <laughs> there, there was a man there. I, I tell you, a thin gray man with, with an overnight bag in his hand. I, I was trying to run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? I'm, tr I'm trying to get rid of him, or at least prove that he's real. But you say you didn't see him back there? You, you, are you sure? I didn't see a soul. And as far as that's well, concerned... Well, you watch for him. You watch for him the next time and keep watching. Keep keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There! Right there! Uh, no. How's this door work? I've got to get out of Did here. Did you see him that time? Did no. you see him? No, I, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. And I don't see how I will very long driving with you. Look, look, I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know so what came over. if you'll excuse me. Please, you, you can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you all the way to California. You're creeping me out, man. Listen, no, please, just just one minute. You know what I think you need, man? Not a girlfriend, just a good dose of sleep. No, no, you can't, you can't leave go. Leave your hands off of me. Just, just leave your hands off of me. Uh, come back here, please. Please come back. She ran from me as if I was some kind of monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up, and, and I knew then that I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to, how to get a hold of myself, if I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right, right here in the car, just a few hours, get some sleep just alongside of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket, uh, just as a, as a blanket, when I saw him coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. I didn't wait for him to come any closer. Well, maybe I should have spoken to him then, but I fought it out then and there, and now he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped even for a minute, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich, he was there. I saw him standing outside the trailer camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was, he was standing near the drinking fountain at a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo Reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque where I bought more gas. I, I was afraid now, afraid to stop. I began to drive faster faster. I was in lunar landscape now, the great arid mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. And now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I could see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in its same attitude over the still and lifeless ground, flitting over dried up rivers, over broken stones, cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in the pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There's a trailer camp here. It's cold, almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling that if I could speak to somebody familiar, somebody that I loved, I could pull myself together. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was in the middle of the morning. I, I knew my mother would be home. I pictured her, tall, white-haired in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. It would be enough, I thought, just, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Hello, Mother? This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? Who, who is this? This is Mrs. Whitney. Mrs. Whitney? I, 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 don't, I don't know any Mrs. Whitney. Is this 7489970? Yes. Who, where's my mother? Where's, where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is this a member of the family? What's she in the hospital for? She's been resting for five days. 
a nervous breakdown. Who is this called? Nervous breakdown? My mother doesn't have it's a... It's taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. The death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what is this? What number is this? This is 7489970. It's all been very sudden. He was killed six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> And so, I'm sitting here in this deserted trailer camp in Gallup, New Mexico. And so I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to, to get a hold of myself, otherwise, otherwise I'm gonna go crazy. Outside it's night, the vast soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa and mountains prairies, desert, and somewhere among them, he's waiting for me, somewhere, somewhere I will know who he is, and who I am. I hope you enjoyed The Hitchhiker, as written by Lucille Fletcher, and performed by Barry Bowman, Joanne Wilson, and Alex Adamson. Up next, we've got one final tale for you, written by Master of the Macabre, Edgar Allan Poe, and once again brought to life by voice actor Barry Bowman, playing all roles. In it, we'll meet a man who, tired of being insulted, amidst the debauchery of a raucous carnival, does what any rational person would do under the circumstances. He plots to murder his friend. Without further ado, I present to you the cask of Amontillado. Fortunato was a pig. He was also an insufferable, avaricious, wine-bloated boar who possessed not one redeeming quality. His thousand injuries I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured on insult, I vowed revenge. But did I give utterance to any threat? Quite the contrary. Neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued as my wont to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his extinction. Now, I confess I went too far when I said he had not one redeeming quality. He prided himself on his connoisseurship of wine. In fact, wine was his weakness. But in this matter, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening during the madness of the carnival season that I encountered my friend. So, after some wait up, my friend. What a real surprise. Oh, all my fellow revelers have abandoned me. <laughs> And now you appear, and just in the nick of time to join me in a flagon of, of a most heady vintage. Mm, perfect for guzzling here. Yeah. My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you're looking today. What's this? What is this regalia you're wearing? Cap and bells? What, what is this? I am a fool. <laughs> Perhaps I should rather say the fool. You see, the carnival has given me opportunity to disguise myself in this, this silly attire so that I may... I may prey upon the young ladies with impunity, for who can say no to a fool? <laughs> They're laughing. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the laugh is overshadowed by my miserable cough. I fear I have a, a slight affliction of the chest. 
<coughs> what business brings you to these streets, Marcus? Uh, I'm in search of some expert advice. You see, I have received a case of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. What? It's a... Amontillado? A case? <laughs> Impossible. And in the middle of the carnival? I say I have my doubts. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado! I... I have my doubts. Amontillado! I have my doubts, and I must satisfy them. (laughs) Amontillado! As you are engaged, I'm on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He'll tell me if it... Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from from Sherry. And yet some uh, fools uh, will have it that his taste is uh, a match for your own. Come, let's go! Go? Where? Where? To your vaults! Oh, no, no, my, my friend, no, no, no. I will not impose on your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Now, Lucchese is not... I have no engagement. Now, come. My friend, no, no. It's not the engagement, but the severe cold with which you're afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They, they're encrusted with go, mold. Let us go, nevertheless. This cold is merely nothing. <laughs> Amontillado, you've been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Please, lead the way. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing my cape closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry at the carnival as well. I had told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to leave the house, and I well knew they would disappear as soon as my back was turned. Thus, my seclusion was ensured. Here, take one of these torches, Fortunato. We shall need them as we descend to the lower suites to the archway that leads to the vaults. Uh, The cask? No, it is further on, but observe the wall's webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. It's mold. (laughs) Yes, mold. How long have you had that cough? It's, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. Come, we will go back. Your health is more precious than mere wine. You're rich, respected, admired, you're beloved. You're happy as I once was. You, you're a man to be missed. For me, that's no matter. We'll go back. You'll be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese. Enough! The cough is, is mere nothing. It, 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 it will not kill me. I shall not die of, of a cough. Yes, true. True. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. Here, a draft of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here, drink. Hmm. I drink to the buried that repose around us, and I, too, to your long life. Ah. Uh, These vaults are extensive, aren't they? Yes, the Montresors were a great and numerous family. The intermingling of bones and casks you see here remind us of the great catacombs of Paris. Come, let me show you how the walls have been lined with human remains. See how the mold hangs like moss upon the vaults? Where are we? We are below the river's bed. See those drops of moisture trickling among the bones. But come, we'll go back ere it's too late. You'll cough. I say it's nothing. Let us go on. But first... Another draft of the Medoc. All right, here. Here. Try the de Grave. <clears throat> Give me that. <clears throat> uh, this sign. You know it? I, I don't understand. Watch my hand. You know this gesture? I, I, I don't... You do not comprehend what what this sign is that I'm making means? Uh, no, I do not. But then you're not, you're not of the Brotherhood. How? The Masons. You're not of... You're not of the Masons. Uh, yes. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, yes. You? Impossible. <laughs> a Mason? A Mason. A sign. Show me a sign. A sign? It is this. A, tr- a trowel? Yes, my dear friend, a trowel. Does not a mason need a trusty trowel? 
<laughs> you jest. <laughs> but let us proceed to the Amontillado. Huh? Be it so. Here, lean on my arm. The traveling will get quite tricky from here. Watch your head now. These archways are rather low. The air is quite... quite foul, isn't it? It's causing our torches to glow rather than... than flame. Yes, it's the... it's the remains that are piled so high overhead. Well, we're almost there. Now, this crypt has a... has a further recess that we must now enter. Be careful, careful. The bones have been strewn in a matter upon the ground. You may... you may trip. <clears throat> what sort of crypt? Was such as this intended? Well, it seems to have been constructed for no special use within itself, but merely forms the uh, the interval between these two supports of the catacombs. Look, solid granite, my friend. <clears throat> I can't. I can't see. I can. I cannot see with such feeble light these torches. Yeah, proceed are... further in for a better look. Herein is the Amontillado, and as far as Lucchese is concerned, he is an ignoramus. I. Uh, la- why can't I go any further? This this wall goes no further in this space then than I this can... is where we must rest, my friend. Here, these irons will ensure you do not fall upon such rubble that may cause you injury. Here, let me further secure your safety about your waist. There. Now, pass your hand over the wall. You cannot help feeling the mold. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? (laughs) Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. (laughs) But the Amontillado! Ah, true! The Amontillado! I believe it's somewhere beneath these buildings. Oh, look! Some... some mortar! Just the thing! How fortunate that I brought my trusty... trowel. Well, what are you doing? My dear Fortunato, what a question to ask a fellow mason. I'm carrying out the secret ceremony of all masons. You are the noble participant in the most ancient of all rituals, the preservation of the secret. This is... this is mad. This is not... what you... What are you trying ah, to... It appears you are also recovering quite nicely of your intoxication. Good. All the better to clearly appreciate my trowel's handiwork, don't you think? Oh, for the love of God, Montessori, don't stop. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Yes, for the love of God, scream. Here, I'll help you. Oh! <laughs> ah! Ah! It's unfortunate that I can't... I can't use some assistance as these building stones surely must have been lifted by more than just one man. I must cease my labors for a moment and sit for a while among these bones. Are you still in there, Fortunato? Here, let me check. Yes, good, good. Ah! Oh! Yee! Louder! Louder now! Come, let me hear you say Louder! That is very good, very good. Oh, what a marvelous work of masonry, I must say myself. Now, just the last single stone took place here. Uh, a little more mortar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a very good job, yes indeed. An excellent jest. Uh, we'll have many a rich laugh about it at the at the palazzo <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> yes! There's the Amatiano. But is it not getting late? Will they not be awaiting us at the palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and all the rest. Let us be gone. For the love of Yes, yes, for the love of God. Fortunato? Fortunato? Fortunato?
Goodbye, Fortunato. <sighs> In pace, requiescat. I hope you enjoyed the cask of Amontillado, as written by Edgar Allan Poe and performed by Barry Bowman. Thanks for listening, and for joining us tonight for this episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. As a reminder, take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave us a five-star review and a kind word, and to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and it's been a pleasure. Don't forget, you can find more of me and hundreds of episodes full of terrifying tales at the Scary Stories Told in the Dark podcast, available wherever podcasts can be found or at simplyscarypodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to make sure you never miss a new release. Thanks for your support. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.